Greetings in the love and peace of Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we gather together. It is he who fills us with joy as we're connected together by his spirit that finds us spread across Connecticut and beyond. Florida and Virginia, it is good to be with you today. We're so glad that we have this avenue for worship where we can continue to seek the presence of God because God is not contained in any church building. God met with his people in the garden. He met with them in the wilderness, in the desert, and in storms on the sea. He spoke in dreams and in gentle breezes. He spoke in song and in parables. He was found by those who were running to him and by those who were running from him. God wants to be found by his people, and he promises if we seek him, he will be found. So thank you for joining us this morning, wherever it is that you find yourself, and wherever your heart is in seeking him. We pray that all of our hearts and minds are ever more open to him, and we trust God's promises that he pours himself into that openness. Let us worship and seek him together this morning. stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before my faith. Carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand. So, what can I say? What can I do? Offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So I'll walk upon salvation, your spirit alive in me, my life to declare. What can I say? What can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. What can I say? So what can I say? What can I do? Offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So I'll stand with arms high.
it all. The one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul on to you, surrendered all I am is yours. So what can I say? What can I do? Offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. Father God, we give you our whole selves and our whole lives. May you use them for your glory. Lord, we love you and we worship you. We give you all that we are. May we not withhold from you, Lord. May we give back to you, take our lives and use them. Have your way, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Would you bow your heads with me and pray as we receive our offering this morning? Father, you are the giver of good gifts, and we are so thankful that you have been faithful to us, that you have given us so much, Lord. We want to give back of our financial resources, our time, our talents, our minds, and our hearts. And Lord, as we do that, we pray that your will would be done. Lord, it's in the name of Jesus Christ, whose plan is perfect, and whose name we worship for all eternity, that we pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. My name is Stephen Lindeberg, and I am blessed to give the congregational prayer this morning. Please bow your heads and pray with me. God, you are El Roi, the God who sees everything. You are the one who chases after us, who follows us with goodness. You are the one who sees us when we feel lonely and when we just need the reminder that you are close. God, you are Jehovah Rapha, the healer. Please make us whole. We ask that this country turns to you for healing of pain. During this pandemic, we ask that you heal those who are sick, provide strength to our healthcare providers, and give comfort to the loved ones who cannot be close. God, you are Yahweh Yira, my provider. Please send us what we need. We ask that we be directed to those around us who do not have food or shelter. We know that you provided us with so many blessings, and we thank you that we can reach out to our neighbors during their time of need. God, you are Yahweh Nisai, my banner. You offer us your protection from all the enemies we face today. We ask for the safety of those we love, both close by and far away. Finally, you are Yahweh Shalom, the God of peace. And we need that more than anything else in our lives today. May we be unified, bound by the faith in your Son, Jesus Christ from whom all blessings flow. May we live to see your son take his rightful place as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. El Shaddai, we lift these prayers to you today. Amen. We're continuing our study in the book of Proverbs, which I'm so excited about. I love the book of Proverbs. Let's pray uh, before we dig into it this morning. Lord, we do thank you that uh, you share your wisdom with us. Lord, uh, all of our hearts desire to have wisdom, to live with wisdom. And so we pray that uh, we hear how you direct us and then we apply it to our lives as we go from here. In your name we pray, amen. Roseanne and I are terrible vacationers. If you heard the sermon last week in my description of our staycation, you knew it already. You didn't need me to tell you. You thought as you listened, there is a guy who doesn't know how to vacation. And some of you are gifted vacationers. You know, some of you, when we hear about your vacations, we all want to go along with you. And none of you thought that when I described my yard work centric staycation. But maybe it's because I withheld one of the details from you. Not only did I do all that yard work, but I also finished my taxes during vacation. Now you want in. Now you want a vacation with the Slaters. I know. Well, but the great vacationers are those who plan them well, right? They research, they read the travel sites, they talk to people who have been there before. They know all of the best restaurants, the underappreciated attractions. They discover all of the hidden hidden gems ahead of time. They don't sit in the hotel lobby and go through those little brochures you find in the lobby. Well, Roseanne and I, when we were both working at church, we planned all day long. So when we got home, we didn't want to make any more plans. So our vacations tended to be improv, thrown together, 
as we went along. But Proverbs 21.5 says this, The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to want. Well, well thought out plans enrich our experiences, right? They lead to abundance, while haste impoverishes. It leaves wanting. And, and that's true of vacation planning, and it's also true of life. To wander through life leaves us wanting, leaves us wanting in that there's this buried clue that more is possible, that there is an abundance to be had. And good planning is done with a goal in mind. And we set career and financial goals, but what's the goal we set for the sum of our life? What's life's ultimate point? Many aim for an enjoyable life and think, well, you know, God is here to help me get there, right? God is a means to my end of this enjoyable life. But scripture, which we believe is the revelation of God to us, says God is the ultimate point. And the joy is in living into knowing him. So how do we plan to reach this goal? How do we plan ahead so that when obstacles and distractions come along, we can deal with them. We seek wisdom, God's guidance, his plan, and his will that leads to abundance in life, the richness of understanding and pursuing the right purposes for right for life, rather than hastily bouncing from one thing to the next, unprepared and ultimately impoverished. Now, Jesus encourages planning. He said, plan before you even decide whether you're going to follow me or not. Count the costs of following me before you embark on the journey. He said, listen, the builder of a tower plans before they start so that they know that they can finish. Do the same thing in faith. Plan it. Know what it's going to take what it is that I ask of you, and what it is that I promise, what I plan for you, so that you can finish. Now, Hebrew, or Proverbs 16, 1 through 3 is going to be our focus this morning. And this is what uh, Proverbs 16, 1 to 3 says. To humans belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plan. Each of these verses is a different proverb, and they prompt us to look at our plans, to ask questions of our plans so that we're pursuing them in wisdom, in fear of the Lord. Fear meaning both awe and intimacy with God. And that first verse, the first proverb says, to humans belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. Who do our plans belong to? What's the interplay between our plans and God's plans, between human freedom and God's sovereignty? Do we plan and then God just comes in and overrules us with a proper answer? Or is it all our planning now and then God's plan comes later, after life? The human initiative and divine purposes work together in a wonderfully mysterious way that doesn't diminish either one of them. Klein Snodgrass, who is a theologian, describes the mystery of this with the phrase, between two truths. He says, between two truths emerge another truth that is greater than the sum of its parts. If plans only belong to God, then whatever we do doesn't matter. We would be fatalistic and inactive. Why act? Why plan if God is going to do what he's going to do with or without us? Why give to the church? Why share the gospel? Why have uncomfortable conversations? If my plan and my will doesn't matter, yet God asks us to do these things. On the other hand, if God isn't involved, then I'm entirely on my own, and that's terrifying. right? I don't have the wisdom and the perspective, the insight of God as I make these decisions.
The Old Testament book of Esther tells us about this incredible woman named Esther who becomes queen. And she is an unparalleled strategic thinker. Her plan for saving her people and nabbing the man who wants to destroy them is simply brilliant. But she initially declined to get involved. A relative of hers, who was her advisor, presses her and he says to her, and who knows but that you have come to this royal position, but for such as a time as this. God planned for her to be in this position. And she takes this position and then she plans her steps to serve God's purposes. She asks all of her people to pray for her as she lays her plan and sets it out in motion. Esther, after asking for the prayers, ends with, if I perish, I perish. And then she's expressing how terrifying our decisions can be. But at the same time, she's also trusting that God will prom God promises to be her shield, that no matter what happens, that he has her and he has us. God shielded Esther from her initial plan of uninvolvement. Imagine the guilt and regret that she would have carried all of her life if she didn't step in and do something. And we don't know what God would have done if she had continued to be uninvolved. But we know that God invites us to share in his plan and meld our plans with his. Karl Barth said, The person who lives by faith may know that in everything which may happen to them, they have to do with God. And what he's saying is that everything that happens, whether it's caused by our plans or by God's plan, God is present and he stays involved with us. You know, that's what's unique about the Christian faith is that God immerses himself in the details of life. Even when uh, people have rejected him, he, he immerses himself in the details and he cares about our details but he doesn't take care of all the details right he gives us freedom and responsibility to act and to plan and to trust and thus we grow in strength and maturity proverbs 16 2 says all a person's ways seem pure to them but motives are weighed by the lord what does god see in our plans because how we see our plans and how God sees them can be very different. We're terrible self-assessors. Charles Spurgeon said, They who are best acquainted with mankind will tell you that self-righteousness is not the peculiar sin of the virtuous, but that most remarkably it flourishes best where there appears to be the least soil for it. Because right? we have this great capacity for self deception. We welcome and seek all information that affirms our plans and our motives, but we don't have nearly the same commitment to any dissenting evidence. When we ask ourselves, why do I want this to happen? Why do I need that? Why is this so important to me? We often tell ourselves saintly stories about it, and that's why we need an outside perspective. Because our motives and our heart is most accurately weighed by God. After an internship that I had in Seattle, I almost took a job in the suburbs of Chicago. And I thought that my motives were to care for my family because I was about to get married and to trust God even in uncertainty because I wasn't sure about the fit. I thought, you know, the motive was that God was going to grow me in trust, even though I was uncertain about the fit. That wasn't my motives at all. My motives were fear, because a good friend of mine had struggled to land a job the year before, and impatience. I wasn't waiting on God, but I was demanding an answer now, going, God, I'm going to pray for a moment, and then I want the answer. So I dressed up sin, fear, and impatience, and I dressed them up as virtue. But God promises his spirit and his word, and he says they penetrate our hearts and reveal our motives. Paul says that we're given the word of God that is alive and active. It penetrates the heart, judging our thoughts and the attitudes that we have. And it judges not to condemn us, but to give us wisdom and abundance. 
Proverbs 16.3 says this, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. We misread that proverb to make it say what we want it to say all the time. We think that we commit our plans to God, we trust our dreams to him, and then he's going to establish our steps to succeed in the plan because we've committed it to him. God, here's my plan for life. I bring it to you. I trust it and trust that you're going to make it happen in Jesus' name. But what the verse says is commit whatever you do. Commit your daily activities to God and he will establish your plan. He will set your plan. And the Hebrew word for commit means to roll over onto. It's to put your full weight onto, uh, to take the weight of the burden off of yourself and to trust it to God. And when you become someone who trusts your day-to-day -day activity to God, he will establish your plans. He will make you a person who makes wise plans. Now commit to the Lord whatever you do is a high price. He says, unconditionally trust me in everything, every detail of your life, both the delightful and the painful. Roll it over onto me. Trust me even if it hurts, even when it's going to cost you. Elizabeth Elliot said, the more we pay for advice, the more we're likely to listen to it. She says, advice from a friend which is free, we may take it or leave it. Advice from a consultant that we pay consultant which we paid for, we may take it, but we may leave it. But the guidance of God is different. First of all, we do not come to God asking for advice, but for God's will, and that's not optional. And God's fee is the highest one of all. It costs everything. To ask for the guidance of God requires abandonment. We no longer say, if I trust you, you will give me such and such. Instead, we must say, I trust you. Give me or withhold from me whatever you choose. As John Newton said, what you will, when you will, how you will, she says. See, finding God's will and his plan is not about bringing ours to him and saying, I trust you, so make this happen. I trust you, so do this, this, and this, and then I'll continue to trust you. Now, God's will and his plan is established when we say, I trust you with abandon. What you will, when you will, how you will, I will trust you. I will trust your will, God, because I know the heart and the wisdom that it comes from. I know the cost that you have paid. Right? Jesus said, think through your plans to follow me. Count the cost. And he said, are you willing to pick up your cross? Daily trusting my plan no matter what comes. And he only asks us to pick up what he has already picked up. We don't pick up his cross because that's too heavy for us. Right? He has paid the greater cost, what we couldn't pay. The ultimate cost for us on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus counted the cost. He sought the will of the Father in the garden. You know, he, he prayed with tears of blood, seeking the will of God, and then he submitted his freedom to the sovereign will of God. And it redeemed the life of all who trust him. May our plans and our freedom, our will likewise trust the Father. And it's there that he'll demonstrate again the abundance that comes from where human freedom and divine sovereignty meet. It is where God does amazing things. Let us pray. Lord, we do ask that you help us to count the costs and then pick up our cross to see what it is that is your plan for us, to see the love and the sacrifice that you put in so that we might know you and we might have the abundance of life of walking our plan in your plan, submitted to you. Lord, help us to see, experience, and submit to that goodness. Amen.
This week, the abundance that comes from finding God's plan and joining with Him in that plan. May they come together and may our lives be blessed. Amen. Here am I.